Fantastic. Today's topic is from pain to prophetic destiny. From pain to prophetic destiny. Actually, if you think about it, that's the journey of any mother. From pain, she gives birth to her child. And she, God gives her the grace to raise a child for the glory of God and for the good of his kingdom. Therefore, realizing a prophetic destiny. I firmly believe with all my heart that every woman under the sound of my voice, whether you have given birth to natural children or not, God has destined you with a prophetic destiny. There is a destiny upon your life. The very fact that you are a womb man. You know, woman means womb man. You have something that a man doesn't have. The womb. It is the womb is a is a, a vehicle, a tool that God uses to receive from a man a seed and to give birth to a full product, a give birth to a destiny, give birth to the purposes and the plans of God. In fact, in the Bible, you look at it that God himself, if he wanted to do something on this earth, he always needed a woman with a womb. Whenever God wanted to raise up a deliverer, he looked for a woman with a womb. When God wanted to raise a prophet, he looked for a woman with a womb. When God wanted to bring his son, Jesus, the Savior, he looked for a woman with a womb. In other words, God himself knew that women has a significant place. That's why you and I, we need to realize there is a prophetic destiny upon your life. That's why when you go through your fiery trials and testings, it is a sign that the enemy fights against not your past, but your future. Enemy fights against what you will give birth to. Because when a woman realizes her potential, when a woman realizes her prophetic place in her family, miraculous things will happen. Supernatural things will happen. That's why one of the core things in this house is we empower women. I do not ever call a man alone for ministry. We always invite both the man and the woman. When my wife and I, we mentor couples, we invite them as a couple to be mentored. Why? Because there is something about a woman's role in life, in ministry, that is significant in the eyes of God. So in this message, what I have is a burden that I wanted to just deliver, but I was looking through the scriptures and found one woman that I truly, truly, truly love. And that woman's name is Bathsheba. This Bathsheba is a controversial figure in the Bible. It's a controversial figure in, in most, in, 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 the, in the general culture. Everyone knows how infamous her name is. She's the woman that took a bath and made a king fall in love with her. But this morning, I want to take her life and look at it scripturally and find lessons for us as we believe for God to move us from pain to prophetic destiny. Who is Bathsheba? Whenever you want to look at a person, you got to look at the person connected to. This is the people that she is connected to. The Bible says her father's name is Eliam or Amiel. Both the names are referred to the father. Who is this man, Eliam? Eliam is the man who was one of the 37 names listed in the Bible as David's mighty man. Eliam is a fighter. He's a warrior. But one, one thing that characterizes him is he is so loyal to David that he is mentioned in the 37 names that are called the David's mighty men. They are men of great valor. Eliam gave birth to, according to the scriptures, at least there are two children ascribed to him. One is Bethshua, Bethsheba, and, and the other one is Machir, which is the, the son. Now, grandfather Ahitophel. I want to talk about Ahitophel. Ahitophel is a man who the Bible says was a wise and trusted advisor of David. Whenever Ahitophel opens his mouth, it is as though God himself is speaking. He speaks the counsel of God. He's one of the wisest and trusted friends of David. But what happens, sadly, if you look at Ahitophel's life, Ahitophel one time really rebelled against David. The Bible is silent about the reason why he rebelled against David and joined the forces of Absalom and in fact became the advisor of Absalom. But if you look at the context, she, he is the grandfather of Bathsheba. 
The third one is the Mahir. Mahir is the, the brother. The Bible actually lists Mahir only twice, and both the times he is seen as someone who is the friend of the oppressed. Jonathan's son was a lame boy, and he grew up in Mahir's house. He gave him shelter and protected him. The grandson of King Saul was raised in this man's house. When David was chased by Absalom, he ran away. David ran away in a hurry, and he had no supplies for his men. That time, Mahir was the one who organized a great caravan full of supplies and met David and refreshed David. Again, loyal to David. So when you look at the family, the family is actually father, grandfather, brother. They were so closely associated with David and very true and loyal friends of David. That's who Bathsheba's family background is. Now, look at the husband. Husband, is the Bible says his name is Uriah. Uriah is a Hittite. Hittite is a, not, not a Jew, but he must have become a second generation Jewish man because the name is a name, a derivative of Yahweh. In other words, he must be loyal to Yahweh. That's why he's now listed as one of the mightiest men of David. Both of them, father and husband, listed in the mighty men of David. 37 names. Uriah was so loyal. You'll find in the pages of scripture that he is so loyal to David, so loyal to the nation of Israel, that he, and so loyal to the troops that he is leading, that he would not even enjoy the company of his wife, even for a single night during the time of war. Wonderful. Now, why I'm listing all this is because I want you to see the context in which Bathsheba grew up with. Her father loves David. Her brother adores David. Her grandfather was the wisest counselor of David. And here, a girl, baby, is born, Bathsheba, and later named as Bathsheba. The father named her twice. You know why? But Shua means the daughter of my prosperity. The father must have enjoyed great prominence in the kingdom, in David's court when she was born. So she named, he named her Bathsheba, the daughter of my prosperity. Later, at the age of 12, when they renamed their children during Bar Mitzvah time, he must have given her a different name because now her character is fully developed. And now she, he gives her a name, Bathsheba or Bathsheba. What Bathsheba means is daughter of an oath. Reminding that God had given us an oath in the, in the Abrahamic covenant. So this is, the, this is the family background. Why I want to emphasize this family background is because many times you look at the woman alone and you don't realize how she's connected. When you look at the scriptures, there are only four chapters where the life of Bathsheba is mentioned. Four chapters and only five incidents where her name and and a scene appears, a narrative story appears. Four chapters. Let me give you the chapters. 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 12. And 1 Kings chapter 1 and chapter 2. It's only these four chapters where the story appears. But as we are looking at her life today, and it's so much to cover, I want to give you some lenses through which you should look at Bathsheba's life. Then it will make sense for us. And I believe that through that lenses, we will see the burden that the Lord has for us this morning. What are the few lenses? The three lenses to view Bathsheba's life. Number one, overtaken by unexpected circumstances. Here is a woman who had been overtaken by unexpected circumstances. Number two, overwhelmed by unwanted grief. There are things that she went through, unbearable pain that we are going to look at. Number three, she is overshadowed by undeserved grace. You will find after she had gone through painful season, God indeed showed her a mighty undeserving grace. These three things, we're going to look at it in detail. Number one, Overtaken by unexpected circumstance. The Bible starts by listing in 2 Samuel chapter 11 and verse 1. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab, his commander, and his servants with him and all Israel. And they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. See, the narrator wants you to know that David, during the time of battle... He remained in Jerusalem. In other words, he wasn't feeling like going out and and, and fighting the war. 
He wanted to stay back and have a downtime. Pay attention to me, men. Downtime is the time you're really vulnerable. It's a time when temptations increase, when you're physically fatigued, emotionally exhausted. You come to a place where your tired soul is looking for some sort of relief. In other words, in the Bible college, we always say, you are too stressed. When you're too stressed, you look for mistress. Mm. And that's exactly what happened. In, in verse 2, it happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. You know, many times we all actually think that Bathsheba was taking a bath in the roof. Not the Bible never says she was taking a bath in the roof. She was taking a bath somewhere, but the king was on the roof and he could see and I don't know what he saw, but whatever he saw, he was so captivated by it. Pay attention to this. What captures your heart? What captivates, what captivates your attention will either take you closer to God or take you away from God. Here in this passage, the Bible says, the next verse, in verse 3, David sent and inquired about the woman and, and the one said, is not this Bathsheba? the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. See, when they mention the name Eliam and Uriah, that should have given him boundaries. This is a girl who grew up in my court. These are men who, who give their life for me. They lay down their life. But yet, when power comes to a person's head and corrupts him, there is no boundary that he would not hesitate to cross. So what happened here? He crossed. The Bible says, so David sent messengers and took her and she came to him and he lay with her. Now she had been purifying herself from her uncleanness. I want you to pay attention to this. Why this is so important? Because there is a contrast in this one verse, verse four. The writer wants you to know, the narrator says here that she had been purifying herself from her uncleanness. In the Bible, when a woman goes through her monthly cycle, it's called uncleanness. And after she had gone through her period, she needs to cleanse herself, purify herself. So she's definitely not pregnant. That's the underlying part. She's definitely not pregnant. That means we imagine this girl who had been married to Uriah and she's hoping this is the year she will get pregnant. And Uriah is about to leave for battle. Don't know whether he will come back alive. And so she's hoping I will have his baby. And then the periods come. That disappointment is there. But then the Bible says, now she had been with David, the woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. You know, Bathsheba often doesn't say a lot of things in the scripture. This is the only thing, the first thing she says, I am pregnant. And this girl, don't know how she was going through this whole thing. See, you and I, when we read the scripture, we sometimes don't, uh, we, we just read it and we change pages. We don't put ourselves in their shoes to think, how would she have felt at that time? What was the emotional state of this woman? See, the Bible did not focus on the emotional state of Bathsheba in this whole thing. Therefore, a lot of, a lot of uh, liberty has been taken, license has been taken in dramatizing this entire story. There are rumors that Bathsheba might have been a scheming seductress. Uh, uh, what do you call it? Seductress, yeah. In Tamil, I was just thinking in Tamil. In English, I forgot. <laughs> seductress. You know, it's amazing when you're talking to your parents nonstop in Tamil. <laughs> Every word that comes out of your mouth now is Tamil. So I got to change, keep changing. <laughs> Excellent. Look at this. I'm pregnant. We saw the emotional state is not mentioned. So let's look at the emotional state. Whatever the emotional state might have been, there are four categories. One, she could have been helpless and compliant. When the king invited her, the Bible doesn't say she refused. The Bible doesn't say she kicked up a fuss. But the Bible says she went, she went and lay with him. So she could have been helpless and compliant. Or she could have been flattered and compliant. Whoa, the king likes me. Finally, someone really knows my real, what, I, what I'm really worth. Or she could have been angry and non-compliant. Or she could have been a scheming seductress. But this is the reality. 
The Bible doesn't say the last three, the last two are true. Angry and non-compliant and scheming seductress. It doesn't work with the Bible data. So what is the one question? Was she really helpless or flattered? Because we all know she was compliant, but was she helpless and compliant or flattered? The Bible is silent. Whenever the Bible is silent, you and I, we need to ask ourselves this one question. Why is there a rhetoric of silence? The rhetoric of silence is in place because God is not minimizing the woman's feeling here, but rather God is making something else as prominent and important. You know what he's making prominent in this whole text? David's adultery. Not Bathsheba's adultery. I want you to listen to me carefully. Bathsheba in the Bible was never called an adulteress. If you are caught in adultery, both, both of them should have been stoned to death according to the law. But the Bible never, prophet Nathan never came and said, adulteress Bathsheba, you need to be stoned. Why would God overlook that entire thing? Unless she was, number one, a helpless and compliant. I ask myself this question, how, who, who would she actually go to for help? Maybe she could have gone to Eliam, but he's in the war. Maybe he's dead or maybe he's alive. She could have gone to Uriah or she could have gone to Ahitopa, but who can you go? Imagine this, she's bathing, coming out. Someone comes and says, the king invites you and she's invited to the king's palace. She may have thought it is news about Uriah. Maybe I better go. And she's coming in a hurried manner. They straight away whisk her into the, into the courtroom, into the bedroom, the royal bedroom. She, the Bible says, she couldn't do anything. Who can she ask for help? Who will actually stand up against the mighty one of Israel? Who would actually stand up against the powerful king? But you know what the Bible says? God held David fully responsible. That's the story there. But I want to take a moment to actually talk about this because I'm talking here about being compliant. I want you to think about this. Bathsheba lived in a different culture to ours. So don't take what I'm about to say and apply it today just like that because we live in a different culture. Bathsheba lived in a culture where the women did not have any rights or very limited rights. But you and I, we live in a culture where you and I, we are protected, especially women, you need to le learn that you are protected, you are empowered. So what I'm about to say, I want to say to all the young girls here, you can always say no, and you will always be able to withstand any advances towards you. And you need to let your parents know if anything is going on. Are you with me? We don't stay silent in this culture. That's not how we are. Australia says no to violence against women. So I just want to plug that in because we want a safe church. Amen? But what the Bible says is that Bathsheba lived in a different scene, different culture. So when you look at her life, she's overtaken by unexpected circumstance. Imagine this, a girl who got married, she comes from a noble family, she gets married and she's pretty excited. She's dreaming about having baby. She's dreaming about having so many kids. Suddenly, the king comes and ruins her life overnight. This is what happened to her, an unexpected circumstance. Secondly, the Bible says she was overwhelmed by unwanted grief. In 2 Samuel chapter 11 and verse 14, the Bible says, In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter he wrote, set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting and then draw back from him that he may be struck down and die. I want you to think about this. In chapter 11, in fact, David is now hearing the word, but Sheba is pregnant. You know what David tried to do? He, he roped in Uriah from the battle. He brought him back. And then he says to Uriah, you must be so tired from the battle and battle weary. I want you to go home and enjoy the company of your wife. Why? Because if she has, if he has time with his wife, maybe David can spread the rumor. It's not his baby. It is Uriah's baby. But what happened next? This is what happens. Uriah was more noble. He just stayed in the courtroom. He did not go. He stayed in the palace. He did not visit his wife. The next day, David hears this. He gets even more angry. So this year, this day he says, I will give you more wine. So he makes him drunk. And then he says, tonight, go home. This boy, after drinking everything, he's still 
turns around and sleeps in Pallas. Doesn't want to visit his wife. So David realizes, man, this guy is truly noble. Doesn't want to. And he asked him, why you don't want to? How can I go and give myself the pleasure of my wife when my soldiers and my commander is still fighting the war? Wow. But that didn't stop David. So David wrote a death sentence for him. David pretty much said, fight him. Let him die. Put him in the hardest place and let him die. Look at this. Not only Uriah died on that day, a lot many people died on that day. And this is one sin that is going to haunt the rest of David's life. Because David has now come to a place where he doesn't go before God and to repent, but rather take matters in his own hands. And he killed the man who was so loyal to him. The Bible says that after the death of Uriah, the news comes back to the wife. When the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she lamented over her husband. And when the mourning was over, David sent and brought her into this house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. I want you to say this first. Sin always displeases the Lord. No matter what you do, any sin whether it's small or big, it displeases the Lord. Here, the Lord has shown incredible favor to David. God had indeed blessed him, lifted him from a, from a shepherd's boy all the way to be the king. But yet the Bible says he fell into this one sin because, and he didn't repent and come back to God. But in this case, listen to this. The Bible says that she was lamenting over her husband and she was mourning. Now, when you read this, sometimes people might look at it and go, was this woman faking this? Was she truly grieving? If she was really participant with, with the David in this whole scheme, was she really lamenting or was it just a ritual that she had to go through? The Bible actually gives you a clue right here. The Holy Spirit writes by dictating three relational terms in one verse, in verse 26. When the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead. She lamented over her husband. Why that emphasis? The emphasis is because it was so close. She really, really missed the guy. She was lamenting over him. She was really grieving. That was an unwanted grief because he was a good man. And the thing truly displeased the Lord. Then the Bible says in 2 Samuel chapter 12, God sends a prophet Nathan. Nathan comes and gives a parable to David. You go home and read 2 Samuel 12. In that parable, he says there was a rich man, poor man. The poor man had only one goat. And the rich man had plenty. But when a visitor came to the rich man's house, rather than taking one of the many goats that he has to serve them good goat biryani, the man took the poor man's one goat and killed it. And the Bible says, you did not hesitate. So David, when he heard this, David was full of rage. He said, who is this man? This man deserves to die. And Nathan the prophet says, you are that man, David. You are the man. In other words, God was portraying through that parable that Bathsheba was actually like a poor little lamb that got slain along the way. That she became the victim in this whole story. I want you to listen to me carefully. Then when, when he pronounced the judgment, David says to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And, they, and Nathan said to David, the Lord has also put away your sin. You shall not die. Why does he emphasize that? Because in the Old Testament, every soul that does sin shall die. And he, they need to be stoned to death for the adultery and for the murder and for the cover up. There were more than half a dozen of the commandments have been broken. By David in this one act but the Lord was merciful God says you shall not die because I have chosen you for my purpose but in nevertheless because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord the child who is born to you shall die then Nathan went to his house and the Lord afflicted the child that Uriah's wife bore to David and he became sick on the seventh day the child died I want you to listen to me carefully after nine months the child comes to the world. This is her firstborn baby. I'm not sure how the woman would have actually felt at that time, lamenting over the, the, and mourning over the death of her husband. And now she is living with the king who had taken her as his wife. And now she's giving birth to the boy that came out of sin. 
out of adultery. And now that boy, from the time he was born, is terribly sick with an incurable disease. I tell you, any mother's heart will be so torn at that time. Not only that, she would have been praying and hoping that God will do a miracle and somehow raise this boy back to life. But the Bible is silent. But what happens next? The baby boy actually dies. When God's judgment visits that person's house and that child died, this nameless child, the child is never named in this passage. It's a nameless child, but it died. And the Bible says she is Uriah's wife at that time that she was bearing to David, this child. The Bible says she was devastated. Look at this in next verse, verse 24. Then David comforted his wife Bathsheba. When you read this, it just overlooks the pain that a woman would go through. You know, over the years, I've ministered to so many women who have stood in lines of prayer for me to pray for them that they would conceive. I remember very clearly being in places where there were so many families that did not, could not have children. Last year, I mentioned to you a testimony that happened in another city where eight families in the church, it's a small church, only eight families could not conceive. And in that day, the Lord gave me only one word to say, go and pray for them. And I prayed. And the Lord opened the womb of six of them. I can see the language. I can see the anguish in, the, in, the, the anguish in their hearts when they come. And there was one woman that just got the news on Friday. She's coming to church on Sunday. She said, I didn't even have the heart to come because they said I can never have. And she was the first one to fall pregnant. Praise God. But there is, a, there is that pain that happens. I clearly remember in our ministry last year, uh, a year, uh, uh, year and a half ago, someone from another church came here and said, can you pray for us? I've had two miscarriages. And my mother said, come here, be prayed for by my pastor, you will have. So I, the, both the husband and wife stood before me and cried and said, we really want my, our second child. Cried out to the Lord and prayed for them. And in my, in, my, in my earnestness, I prayed, Lord, give them a double portion of what they lost because they lost two babies. And she went back, came back three months later. She goes, I'm pregnant now. And the doctors have confirmed it's twins. I was super excited. I said, praise God, wonderful. Then I was away overseas. She goes into labor later on. Just a week before the labor day comes and she's in intense pain and she lost one child. And she was, she was going to lose the second one. And they quickly did an operation and saved the second one. That news really devastated me. I was crying out before God. And I said, Lord, this is so painful. For me as a third party, it was so painful. I can't imagine the pain that the young mom would have gone through. One of the most unbearable pain a woman goes through is when she loses her child. But here in Bathsheba's story, there's a double whammy. She's not just lost her baby boy that was just born, but she also lost her husband, her first one. In other words, he's a good man. He died, and it's an innocent child, and the child dies. A woman who lost her children, two of her children wrote this. She says, Surviving the loss of a child is an unbearable pain. The aftermath of child loss can be filled with grief, anguish, guilt, rage, fear, loneliness, and a terrible sense of failure. I can imagine Bathsheba going through this. She would have been grieving because she has already been grieving for her husband with whom she probably really desired to build a future. And here's a, there's an anguish. Could I have done things differently? There is that guilt that comes. It is because of my own sin. It is because of what I did. Maybe I should have not yielded to this. There is a rage that comes. Who do I blame for this? And there is a fear. What if God is not finished with dealing with this sin and he continues to take the lives of every other child that I ever will conceive? Unknown entity and a terrible sense of failure. I'm pretty sure Bathsheba would have gone through that. 
I want you to think about this. In life, there is unexpected circumstances. There are unwanted griefs that we go through. But one of the things that the Lord does in the story of Bathsheba is his redemptive work. As we always say here, when you go through your deepest and darkest hour, God is actually doing his deepest work in your life. When you are going through painful seasons that no man is able to understand, even the one who caused it cannot fix it. Even having a father who is like Eliam, a mighty warrior, cannot fix it. Having the greatest, wisest counsel in your grandfather cannot fix it. Having a brother who is so loyal and friendly and helping everybody else cannot help you. In other words, she is lost and lonely in this situation. I'm not sure how she will ever see light, but the reality is the God who sits on the throne, he is still sovereign and he is still good and he is still God. Can you say amen? The Lord who is Lord of Bathsheba still is in charge. That's why there is a third point over her life, a third lens. She is overshadowed by undeserved grace. The Bible says, let's look at that same verse, 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 24. Then David comforted his wife Bathsheba and went in to lay and lay with her. And she bore a son and he called his name Solomon or Shalom, Solomon. And the Lord loved him and sent a message by Nathan the prophet. So he called his name Jedidiah, beloved of the Lord, because of the Lord. I want you to listen to me carefully. In this verse is hidden a grace that God bestows upon Bathsheba's pain. Don't miss this. Because when the narrator says this word, the David comforted Bathsheba. And this is the first time the narrator actually uses the word his wife. Up to now, the Bible actually says it's Uriah's wife. But there is a shift now because Uriah is dead. She's now married. And the child that was born to her through David while she was married to Uriah is now dead. And God now shifts the entire focus. David comforted his wife. I always have this question. What could have David said to Bathsheba that would have made Bathsheba so comforted? And give her a hope in the midst of such evil and cruelty and pain, what would turn a woman's heart around and what will give her a future and a hope and a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a purpose in life? It is in that word, comforted. Because in this one word, you see that David must have said something to his wife that actually made her turn around. And the Bible says he called his name Solomon. David called the child's name Solomon. Isn't that ironic? The child that was just born and died, twice the Bible says, nameless child. The child, the child, no name. But this one na baby that is born gets two names. Not one name, two names. The, the writer, the narrator wants you to highlight this. Why? Because he wants you to focus that there is something special about this baby, Solomon. What was so special? When you look at that word Solomon, it is a word that for shalom. It is a word for peace. It is a word that, that, that would probably symbolically reveal to David and Bathsheba that God is no longer mad at us. He has forgiven us our sin. He has forgiven us our adultery. He has forgiven us our sin. He's no longer going to judge us. He has already judged. An innocent had already died. We are free. I want you to listen to me carefully. Look at this. When, she, when he names her Solomon, when he names him Solomon, he's saying God is, is at peace with us. We are at peace with God. That's the first one. The second one, I believe he will also would have said to her is, by naming him Solomon, I'm telling you that there will be peace, not only with God, but also in our household. I need a little bit more volume here. I, we will have peace in our house. We will have the blessing of the Lord. The blessing of the Lord. And then the Bible says, he sent prophet Nathan to him to tell him that how much God loved Solomon. Therefore, 
David names the son again, Jedediah, which means the Lord loves you. Why would a father name the son twice? Because hidden in there is this one truth that the first name was given by the Lord and not by David. The second name is what David gave him, Jedediah. But the first name was actually given by the Lord. There are seven babies in the, in the Old and New Testament that before they were born were given the names by God. God revealed to, the first one was Isaac, the first one was Ishmael, then Isaac. And the third one in the Bible is actually Solomon. If you look at the next, pass, next page, in 1 Chronicles chapter 22 and verse 8, David recounts the story when Solomon is now uh, a lot older and he is now going to be appointed as king. David mentioned this to him. He says, once upon a time, the word of the Lord came to me saying, you have shed much blood and have waged great wars. You shall not build a house to my name because you have shed so much blood before me on the earth. Behold, a son shall be born to you who shall be a man of rest. I will give him rest from all his surrounding enemies for his name shall be Solomon and I will give him peace and quiet to Israel in his days. God gave the name Solomon to David. What was David's heart? David's heart was, Lord, I want to build you a temple. God says, I don't want you to build a temple. Why? You have shed blood. So who is going to build a temple? Your son will be born. Wow. Right there is a, is a twist in the story because by now David has so many sons. But God actually says, don't worry, David, a son will be born to you from here on. And the very next son that is born, you know, is the son with Bathsheba, the one that was incurable disease. That was the firstborn after this promise was made. So David cried before God and says, David cries and he says, God, you said that the son that is going to be born will become the person that builds the temple. Now this person is so dying, do something. He wept and cried and prayed. But God didn't do anything. And in fact, the baby died on the seventh day. No wonder after the news came that the baby actually passed away. You know what David did? He did the opposite of what everyone else would have done. He got up, he took a shower and asked for a feast. And he ate. And they were perplexed by his behavior. They asked him, why are you doing this? You were mourning for the baby when the baby was sick. Now he is dead. You're feasting. What happens? He said, the baby cannot come to me but I can go to the baby. In other words, it's gone, it's gone. But God is not finished with me. That is the whole theology. He believed that there is another baby. And that baby that's going to be born next, he's going to name him what? Solomon. And when he named him Solomon, he will grow up to be the boy that builds the temple. And guess who falls pregnant again? The one who would take the bath, Bathsheba. So now he says, Bathsheba. You want to know a secret. This is a royal secret. You know what it is? God says, the child that's going to be born, I name him Solomon. He will be the king. Wow. All of a sudden, the mother gets a boost in her life. I thought I'm finished. The pain that I endured, the embarrassment that I endured, that's nothing, no future for me. Suddenly, there is a twist in the story. There is a hope. The baby that's going to be born will be the next king. Wow. Here comes. So no wonder he named him Solomon. And how, why would I know that there would have been some sort of relationship between David and, and Bathsheba about this baby is because when the baby is a lot older and David is now a lot older and he's about to die and someone else is claiming the throne, Her, his, one of the fourth sons, his, his, long, his eldest son now, he's the eldest because everyone else died. Adonijah is claiming the throne while David was in his sickbed. And Bathsheba hears about it. And she goes to David and she pleads for Solomon. Look at what he says. So Bathsheba went to the king in his chamber. Bathsheba bowed and paid homage to the king. And the king said, what do you desire? She said to him, my Lord, you swore to your servant by the Lord your God saying, Solomon, your son shall reign after me and he shall sit on my throne. And what did David say? 
And the king swore saying, as the Lord lives who has redeemed my soul out of every adversity, as I swore to you by the Lord, the God of Israel, saying, Solomon, your son shall reign after me. He shall sit on my throne in my place. Even so, I will do this this day. Then Bathsheba bowed with her face to the ground and paid homage to the king and said, may my Lord King David live forever. Why is this so important? I want you to listen to me carefully. That's the season when David actually acknowledges. No one knows. There is no record of David ever giving a promise to Bathsheba, except the Holy Spirit writes it here through the lips of Bathsheba and confirmed through the lips of David. But you know what the Bible says in 2 Samuel? The only word that the Bible gives you as a connection is, and David comforted Bathsheba. And if he comforted her, he gave her something to look forward to in the future. And now the Bible says, she bowed down to her, with her face to the ground and paid homage to the king and said, may the Lord King David live forever. That day, David says, Solomon is king. All of a sudden, this poor woman who lost her first husband, who, was, who committed an adultery with David. Maybe she was a helpless victim. She, got, she, got, she, got, uh, she, she was roped into this adultery. First husband dies. First child dies. Suddenly God gives her the grace to raise the next king. I want you to listen to me carefully. Years later, after Solomon has now become king, 1 Kings chapter 2 and verse 19, Bathsheba went to King Solomon to speak to him on behalf of Adonijah. You go and read the story. I don't have time to explain. And when, he, when she goes to see King Solomon, you know what Solomon does? He rose to meet her and bowed down to her. Then he sat on his throne and had a seat brought for the king's mother, and she sat on his right side. I want you to listen to me carefully. Solomon loved this mother. <laughs> Solomon loved his mother. And you know what Solomon does? He's now the king over Israel. He takes down and he bows all the way down and he says, I respect you, I give you honor. Wow, the king adores her. Now, not only that, he says, bring her a seat. This language says a seat. In the original, it says, bring her a throne. It's the same word for the throne. And he says, put her on my right side. All of a sudden, this powerless woman has become the most powerful queen mother. I want you to think about the way God redeems. There is a prophetic destiny that God had for this woman, Bathsheba. And, and David knew that there is, a, there is a private pain that Bathsheba went through. There is a private pain because that she could not complain to anyone about David. There's a private pain. But then David gave her a personal promise that one day, your son will be king. That is a personal promise. That personal promise would have given her a passionate purpose in life. She would have gained purpose and say, I need to live for this. I cannot keep, deep, uh, keep going back and looking back at the past and look at the past failures and feel guilty about the past or look at the past pain. I need to let go. I need to let go of my past because there is a glorious future. And she turns around and she says, I have a passionate purpose. The purpose is, to raise the next king. And she did. And the king acknowledges by bowing down to her and says, you are the one that he honors. Not only that, God began, God does his own honor. The grace that God bestowed upon this woman, look at this one verse with me. First Chronicles chapter 3 and verse 5. These were born to David in Jerusalem, Shimea, Shobab, Nathan, and Solomon, four children by Bathsheba, the daughter of Hamiel. Bathsheba actually had four sons with David. And the last, it's mentioned last because in the narrator's point of view, the last is what you will remember. So he will go by the reverse order. So he's going by the fourth son is Shimea, and then Shobab, and the second born is Nathan, and then the first born after the death of that unnamed child, is Solomon. And God takes these two kids, Nathan and Solomon, and God puts them right in the lineage of Jesus. One was the parent, 
One was, the, one was in the lineage of Joseph, the earthly parent of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 1 and verse 6, you read, David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. The English translation here says, by the wife of Uriah. But actually, the original says, by Bathsheba, who had been the wife of Uriah. And the second one is the son of Nathan, the son of David. Mary came from that line. In other words, can you imagine a woman who was, who was, rest, who was blessed by David's promise, but now God himself makes a special consideration and says, in your sons, I'm going to have my Jesus, the Christ, going to be born. What a beautiful thing that the Lord does. In fact, in that lineage, if you find, there are only five names of women that are mentioned in Matthew chapter 1. And one of them is Mary. Mary will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. In other words, Bathsheba gave birth to sons who gave birth to sons who gave birth to sons. And the final one, the Bible lists, is Mary giving birth to Jesus. In fact, Jesus came to die for Bathsheba's sin. Jesus came to die for David's sin. Jesus came to die for your sin and my sin. And God placed such a godly lineage in that woman's life. Three lenses to view Bathsheba's life. Looking at life when, let's read it together. One, overtaken by unexpected circumstances, overwhelmed by unwanted grief, and overshadowed by undeserved grace. From pain to prophetic destiny. I don't know who you are this morning and what you're going through, but every woman under the sound of my voice, please listen to this, what I'm going to say next. As a woman, you will go through situations and circumstances where you feel like what she did, a powerless victim of circumstance. But what God does is he does bring you to a powerful role. There is a prophetic destiny upon your life. Don't miss it. Now, what is that? To walk in your prophetic destiny, can I give you these three things for your consideration? You need to learn to release your private pain. You cannot keep harbor harboring over that pain. You cannot keep revisiting that pain over and over again. Because what happens is, just as a, as a, as a scar, just as a, as, a, as, a, as a cut or a pain that comes in your, in your skin, you keep looking at it, you keep, you keep probing it, it will never heal. What God does is He wants you to release. Until you release, there is no future. The prophetic destiny doesn't kick in until you come to learn to release. That's why we do Breakthrough Weekends. Breakthrough Weekends is a place where you come and do business with God, where you come and you lay down and you release before God. Release your private pain. The second one is you receive your personal promise. For every season, for every time that you're going through a painful period, what is going to keep you anchored and what is going to give you hope is the personal promise that comes from the lips of our God. Last week, I spoke to you about the centurion's faith. The centurion's faith is all about just give me one word and my servant will be healed. Give me one word, my situation will change. Lord, give me that word, that promise that all things will work together for my good and for your glory. In your time, I will see it and I will delight. It is receiving from the Lord, pressing in, leaning in until you hear him. And the third thing is that you come to a place where you resolve your passionate purpose. God has a purpose for you. Whenever the Bible says that women go through pain, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 16, a woman will go through pain, but then she will forget that pain. She will fall in love with her husband and the newborn baby. Jesus himself said, the pain you will endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. You pain, you go through when you give birth to a child, but then when you look forward to the future, when the birth of a son or a daughter is born, you will have joy. In other words, there is always a joy that follows your pain. So don't make the pain a permanent address. You've got to let go and receive that promise and come before God and say, God, give me that 
passionate purpose that I need to live for. But in all this, I want to address only one thing that the Bible speaks about Bathsheba. You know, the Bible is so <coughs> silent about many of her life and her attributes. But there is in that silence, you can actually see three things. And I pray that that is something that you will cultivate. Because that silence, that quietness is a condition of her heart. It is the disposition of her inner life. And this is what it is. She cultivated, I believe, she had an, a stillness about her life. A stillness. One of the things that's hardest to do is when you're going through a tough season to be still. Because we are now, you and I, we, are, we try to fix everything. You and I, we need to want to fix everything. You know, we cannot, we cannot stand leaving things ambiguous. We cannot leave things hanging. We want to find a solution. We want to fix it. We want to do it. And, and most women that I've encountered in my ministry, they're godly women, but they're very over, what do you call it? They want things fixed, like yesterday. Deep down, you know what I find? That is the issue of control. It's an issue where you are still driving your life. It's an issue where you're still directing your life. It's an issue where you're still trying to deliver the result you want by issue of control. It's a control because of fear, because of insecurity, because of past pain, past baggages, whatever it is, deep down, the issue is control. I cannot let go and let God. I have to manage it myself. So you, the hardest thing for a woman to do is to be still, especially when the people around you are making all sorts of decisions that is affecting you. How to remain silent, how to remain still, how to remain in that posture where you are quiet and you're confident and you're resting in God. That's the hardest part. But the Bible says a virtuous woman will have that. Her life will be filled with such stillness. You look at the pages of Scripture, but Sheba never flustered. I'm taking a preacher's license here to tell you this, that he is, there is a stillness. In fact, if you look at the whole pages of Scripture, there's only four times that woman opens her mouth to speak that's recorded there. Only four times. The first time is, I'm pregnant. The second time is when she speaks on behalf of Solomon to King David. She's pleading for her son to have the throne. The fourth time she ever spoke in the Bible, she was interceding for Adonijah to King Solomon. In other words, whenever she's speaking, she's not speaking for herself. She's actually speaking on behalf of others. Wow. There is a stillness about her life. How can you ever come and bow down to the man who actually did all this crime in your life? Unless you had come to a place where you had forgiven, let go, and come to that place of receiving from the Lord. The second thing is that there is a submissive spirit. She bowed and paid homage. Never, you will ever see in the pages of Scripture, she pointing finger at David. There is a submissive spirit in her life. The third one, there is a surrendered heart. But I know for a fact, even if Bathsheba didn't have any of these things, you and I, we need to cultivate these things. Whether it's a woman or a man, I need these three things. To be still and to know that He is God. To be able to submit when everything within you revolts. That submissive posture, that spirit of submission is vital for our life. Thirdly, that surrendered heart. The only reason why we will surrender is because God is in control. And God is good and God is wise and God will always bring His purposes come to pass in our lives. So therefore, I can live a life like that. The Bible says in the New Testament, let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in God's sight. 
Let every woman under the sound of my voice say amen. Every head bow, every eye close all across this place.